It's Wednesday, weather wagers time. You might be listening to this, though, as you head into your weekend. We hope you find us no matter where you're at. And, uh, boy, what a week we uh, are going to talk about here. We've got a special guest coming up. We've got Brett Thacker, Dan Tommaso with you. And we've actually got some snow out our window this morning. So it's a wild weather day ahead. And 70s in sight. So, (laughs) you know, I was just hearing some banter yesterday about college baseball opening up and how it's so hard to do it in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. Today's one of those days in spring that – you can't really plan for. You can't really deal with that easily when you're dealing with outdoor sports. And it's not even spring, but it's February. We have we had, unfortunately, there were some tornadoes earlier the week in New Jersey and, and places where, you know, the, it's like, how is this happening in February? Just a, just a friendly reminder here from your weather wagers hosts. Tornadoes yes. can happen any time of the year at any hour of the day, and it's always good to be prepared for that. So that that's our weather announcement for the day. <laughs> and it's a, it's a good one because, again, a day like yesterday, um, so we're going back to Tuesday's severe weather, there was even hail in places, too. And you know, people don't realize how much damage hail can do. I'm one of those people that had to have a whole roof re- replaced because of hail damage. So check your all, insurance. We're already <laughs> into that time of the year where we're thinking about thunderstorms and then back to snow and rain. And, and that means we're going to be thinking about baseball, which we will exactly. soon enough. All right. Tell people how they can find us, Dan, because we always love to hear from you. Oh, and, and absolutely. We're going to talk about, too, uh, how folks can find us and then what's what's coming up on the podcast now that we're kind of in a lull for sports. Just well, a little lull. it's a very short lull, so you can find us online, abc27.com. You can also search YouTube for ABC27 News. There's a whole playlist that includes weather wagers, but we also tease and put out different promotions and segments on Facebook and Twitter. So, Brett, you are at meteorologist Brett Thackera. I'm at meteorologist Dan Tommaso. You can also find us, same handles for Twitter and Instagram. You're Brett Thack, ABC 27. I'm Doppler Dan. And you've you've been doing these coffee talks here lately, and and you've been busy talking about all this different weather. So even if you're looking for a forecast, you can can get us. Uh, WeatherWagers2 at gmail.com. You can send us your thoughts and and give us... uh, And it's great to hear from people. It it is, and we have. And and we actually uh, recently heard from from somebody uh, from a Phillies fan and and a Philadelphia fan. So um, we want to hear from you and uh, we are talking more about that stuff coming up speaking of the Phillies and speaking of spring weather um, we do have a special guest to get to not about the Phillies but that's coming up but before we before we get there um, it is that time of year. What are you hearing and reading? You know, I, I know our, our friend now. Can we call him that? Matt Galvin? Yeah, he was here. Show. Uh, he, he was uh, posting a lot about the, the Philly spring training. I mean, busy, busy guy. Uh, everybody on that beat is busy. What have you been hearing from spring training? It, it is happening. Well, perhaps <laughs> the, the biggest quote to come out of spring training came from the owner, which is not often that you hear too much from the ownership of these different teams. But there's a big debate right now in baseball about how much money you should be spending on payroll. and John Middleton, the majority owner of the Phillies, came out and said, you know what? Did the 27 Yankees care how much revenue they got back from the team? No. Did the Big Red Machine care about how much revenue came from the team? No. No. And is anyone going to care how much money I made 20 years from now if we get a few World Series? No. People want to win, and And the city wants to win. And by the way... If you win multiple World Series, I think you're going to make money. You're going to make money. You're going to build a fandom that's going to last for decades. And I think that's what was most frustrating coming out of the World Series runs of 08 and 09. We, you know, obviously build a heck of a rotation, one of the best likely in history between Halliday, Lee, Hamels, Oswalt, Blanton. I mean, that, it's that really was, shocking we didn't win more than right. We did. And and then after that, you know, the, the the thing that was in vogue in baseball was to tank. Right. And so we, we took our lumps. I mean, the mid-2010s were rough. And Very much so. They stopped spending money, but then all of a sudden, you see what happens in the city. You start spending money. First, it kind of started with the Joe Girardi teams. They started spending more money. Then, obviously, he gets let go last year, and they go all in. But they you know what else in. helps with that, too? Having a good general manager. Right, and so that's that's been the difference. That the general manager, Dave Dombrowski, he has been – Aggressive. Aggressive. He has and he not wants been to afraid. Win. He's no. not been afraid. And you can't operate out of fear of <laughs> we, trading We talk assets. about that all the time. You cannot lead by fear. Yeah. And, and, and he has the experience. He has led multiple franchises now to World Series appearances. So it just it was refreshing to hear. If you are a Philadelphia sports fan, you have to be excited about what John Middleton's saying. Uh, 100%. Quickly, let's bring in Dave Shiner, our, our resident audio engineer and our Phillies fan. Uh, first, Dave, I want you to look this up for me. When is opening day, and who did the Phillies play? And while you're doing that, two words, gentlemen, and then we're going to move on from the Phillies, but Andrew Painter. Andrew Painter uh, looks sharp so far. I mean, from what we yes. can see in the videos, I mean, I would not want to face him. And he, the big thing with him is 
He's tall and lanky. So usually guys like that in their delivery can hide the baseball. I mean, think about someone that's six 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 seven. That baseball is tiny coming out of their hand and a lot of moving parts, and that can throw off hitters. If he can give us 120, 150 innings this year, that is such a shot in the arm. I mean, I, I like Kyle Gibson. He's a good guy. He does a lot in the community, but he didn't have much left last year. If you replace Kyle Gibson with a guy throwing 98, 99 a with, young guy with movement, throwing that. Too. I mean, that's a that's an improvement just based on last year's team without even thinking about the additions they made this offseason. Yep, and uh, I guess it's TBD on whether we will see him on opening day, which uh, the, the official MLB opening day is Thursday, March yes. 30th. Usually and they do that like one game and then there's two days it's off. It's everybody now. You know, so everybody's kind of getting that, that real early. I mean... Hopefully it, there there isn't snow flying at that point here. You, <laughs> you never, never know. know. That's why they that's, go to Florida. That's my to wedding start, anniversary. Wait, so, so yeah. uh, on March thirtieth. Yes, March thirtieth. Uh, okay. My will wedding she, anniversary. She, will she let you watch the Phillies? Oh yes, but I was bringing that up because we, you know, knowing me, I went back through the climatology of Pennsylvania to see what were the odds of snow, and it's mm-hmm. really really low at well, that are, time. Are, well, are the Phillies at home? Are they starting at home this year? Stand I don't believe by. they are. We'll that, get that, into that. Now. But my I, point is saying yeah. that is. The Northeast may be okay, but it's yeah. the Midwest. It's like Chicago. I could see a driving snow squall coming through Wrigley Field. It's happened before in March and April. Yeah, yes, no doubt about that. So um, that that's something, though, that you, you can almost, with these warm days, though, that we've had in, in February for a good part of the country, you can almost just taste opening day of baseball. And now that the, the Super Bowl has ended, a lot of fan bases are ready for that. So um, what do we have there, David? Are we um, are we close to uh, figuring this out? I, I'm, I'm just curious if, if they're going to open us up in division or where no, we're at. they will be at Texas. Okay. Oh yeah, the uh, Rangers. Okay, so is that a two-day series? Start. Two two-day series. Stand by. I keep asking you these questions. The, ne- the next month here. Yeah, yeah. And speaking uh, of spending yes, money, it's a two-day series That's with a I day thought. off in between. Gotcha. Oh, okay. So it's Thursday then, and then Saturday. Saturday. It's actually a three-day series. They play uh, Saturday and Sunday. Sunday. They're building okay. in time to yeah. you know deal with any delays or issues they yeah. may have. Obviously, right. down there you don't have to worry about it. No, it's going to be hot. I'm Which, sure. Um, the Phillies actually stay on the road for the first two series because they then go to. The Yankees for a oh. three-game series so, after that. Okay, you know we we just bragged so, about the Phillies spending money. Mm-hmm. Texas has spent seven hundred million dollars in the last bit. two seasons. Everything's bigger there, Dan. And the Yankees so just dropped nearly a half billion dollars on Mr. Aaron Judge. Mm-hmm. I mean, again, you gotta like what's happening in baseball right now. There is money just being floated around. There's for talent the big galore. for the big market. Yeah. Teams. yeah, that's the problem. The right. big markets feast when we know the smaller markets are always left. Well, and investing. I don't want to dive too far into this unless but you get into money. The uh, Angelos <laughs> family in Baltimore is having their fair mm. share of issues and and how much they should spend on payroll. So just a little drive south, and it ain't so rosy. No, it's yeah. not. And that was, of course, one of the premier teams back in the '90s. So they, they, how mm-hmm. far we have fallen. Okay, I want to turn to uh, Dan. Yes. Uh, take it away with some coaching care. Carousel news, please. Yes. So, obviously, the big one, Eric Bieniemy, um, just won a Super Bowl. He is now going to be the offensive coordinator for the Commanders under Ron Rivera. What do we think of that? That's a lateral move. It's a lateral move, but he gets to call plays. Big Red was always calling plays mm-hmm. in in the chief in the chiefdom out there what, in Kansas City. Do you think there's more to that story than than, than goes on? Because again, we talked last week how you know if I'm Eric Bieniemy and I'm not, but you, you have a quarterback, you have a, a dynasty. You know, you, you could take a head coaching job somewhere and uh, and, and flounder. Yes, um, It could. seemed like a very good setup. But yeah. do you think that there was perhaps more under the surface there than, than meets the eye that maybe he wasn't happy? I mean, this is not a great organization he's going to. He does not have a quarterback. No, no. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I quite frankly, I don't get it. I don't get it. I, um, Shiner, you could probably back me up on this. You probably saw what I saw. Uh, hmm. Mr. LaShawn McCoy. That's Bishop exactly McDevitt, what I was going to bring uh, up. Yes. Former yes. Bishop McDevitt student yep. and uh, – Played under Andy Reid for both the Eagles and then late in his career with the Chiefs. He did not have a glowing review of no, Mr. Bieniemy. I mean, he all but said the guy didn't do anything. It was all Andy. Um, mm-hmm. He even made the comment that unless it was a running back adjustment, Eric didn't say anything to the offense much often. Now, I mean, is this the Shady who obviously things? at yeah. that point was just catching two rings on the bench, which I, I love Shady, but I mean – he didn't do much for that team either, so it's it's a little weird kind of sour grapes out of him out of that. I expect I, better. I, I thought so, too. But maybe that plays into the fact that everybody wanted Biennemi to get a head coaching job, and, and because of the way he's under Andy Reid, 
someone wants to see him do the play calling first before they promote, which with Riverboat Ron there, who knows how much longer he's going to stay into coaching. Maybe it's a grooming process. Yeah, maybe That's he sees that. That's the only thing I can think of. Right, maybe he sees that but as a way in, but I, I still... strange that he came out saying that I mean, on national television. Yes, you know? I agree. It's just... It's Especially also a, promoting an, another yeah. African-American right. yeah. coaching position. It, it's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a terrible organization. And it's just a mm. terrible look. I mean, yeah. the McCoy thing, like you just said, is a terrible look. You know, what is going on? I'm not quite sure, but... Hey, you know, if, if he wants the challenge of being with the commanders, God bless him. Well, and if he wants the challenge of dealing with that quarterback room, right. good luck. What what quarterback room? Well, right. He's going to have to find some. The first. other the other fun one real quick is I know we got to get to our, our special guest, but mm-hmm. um, I thought this was interesting that uh, Jim Bob Cooter is now <laughs> yeah, the <he's>... OC <laughs> under Shane Steichen, which I, I don't know what to make of that move. Uh, you know, Shane, you're going to have a, a hard road to, to, to go uphill here with the, the in, in Indianapolis Colts. I mean, just as bad as the yeah. commanders. Jim Ursay. Is is running that team into the ground? They yeah. don't have a quarterback. It makes no apologies for it, by the way. No, they have and, no quarterback, uh, and you know, good luck. Just well, good luck to Jim Bob. Do you think though that that's going to be Shane's offense, and and Jim Bob so. is going to just kind of be push the buttons there. a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it certainly could be. Um, and then the other piece of news is we're still not sure who the Eagles are going to have calling defensive plays yet. Um, mm-hmm. A lot still, of names getting thrown out there now. Yes. I, I even heard a one Seth Joiner. Talking about if the Eagles would come to him, he'd be open. Now, I mean, Seth isn't known for his coaching. He's been more on the media side. But, I mean, I think at this point, people are just looking for stuff to talk about. Sure. I mean, even uh, with Jonathan Gannon being uh, very open about that the Eagles came back with more money for a D.C. job than he was offered for a head coaching job. I don't know how much is smoke and mirrors in that one. But well, it's a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about we know, in the offseason. We, we know, you know Jeffrey Lurie is big into True. his coaches and wants some control there. So it doesn't mm-hmm. shock me. And by the way, real quick, uh, before we let Mr. Shiner go and we introduce our guest, do, I mean, we haven't heard anything about the Eagles. And I said last week yeah. I, I had kind of expected it to happen. It, it's been pretty quiet, right? And, well, and maybe that means they're being selective. Yeah, I, I think they're being very thorough. I, and I mean, that never hurts. But right now, I think it's just a lot of names getting thrown around, and we'll see what's real and what's not sure. over the coming weeks. Yeah, you know? I, I just, I mean, again, at some point, we're going to be sitting here talking about it. I, I just, I, I would think it would be next week. But again, uh, who knows? The well, draft the draft is coming. Yeah, the draft is coming. You'd hope before the draft they'd have all their, their ducks their, in a row. That yeah, also yeah, kind exactly. of shows me, though, whose draft is it really? Mr. Mm. Howie Roseman's. Well, no, 100%. And, and again, it, some of these people, some of these organizations, they don't let their coordinators have a say. So Correct. that that And, again, maybe they're being selective. So, David, thank you. Yep. Always. Uh, Dan, let's go to the uh, two box here and uh, introduce our one of our favorite uh, folks. We follow her all the time. We and certainly if, do. If you are a fan of Penn State football, you're going to know who we mean, and uh, you're going to be excited about this. Yeah, this is the – Audrey Snyder <laughs> yeah. from The Athletic. And w- there's a lot of evergreen topics we cover here, from the Rose Bowl to um, Franklin's recruiting strategies to looking ahead to next season. Um, but I will say this. Uh, it's hard to find anybody that has their pulse on the, the Penn State beat more than Audrey. She is dialed in. I also appreciate that she keeps asking for a depth chart. It's never going to happen, but I, I appreciate her persistence. <laughs> she needles Franklin a she little does. bit. She and does. I love that. We love that about her. And also, big Green Bay Packers fan, which also comes up in the interview. It does. It does. So without further Further ado, let's go ahead and send it over to Audrey. Forward to chat with Audrey Snyder, Penn State beat writer from The Athletic here on Weather Wagers. And, and Audrey, let, let's start by asking what makes you tick a little bit. You've been covering Penn State football for a while now. There's rarely a dull moment with this team. So what keeps you going and, and what do you enjoy about it? Yeah, you're right that nothing ever stops or slow down here. I mean, I love when people ask me, like, oh, what do you do in the off season?" I'm like, honestly, like, it's football year round for me. Like, that's just kind of how my job is. And yeah, between recruiting, transfer portal, like, it's, it's always something. Um, but I do think, like, that chase of not knowing what every day is, like, to me, that's exciting. Now, I'll be completely honest, it's also maddening sometimes, right? When it's like, you know, hey, Sunday night and... Penn State fires a receivers coach, right? Like, not, <laughs> right. not how you yeah. want to spend your Sunday night, um, but it happens, and that's kind of just just the business of it. Well, and you just said about the, the grind and the everyday change. I mean, that's kind of what keeps Brett and I going in the meteorology field. So as meteorologists, we went to Penn State. We got to enjoy a lot of home football games, the Joe Paterno era, and I got to see a little bit of the Bill O'Brien and the James Franklin era. But, you know, during that time, and even as a kid, I remember games. Brett, I know you do, too where weather impacts Penn State football. It's Big Ten, it's cold, it can be rainy, it can be snowing. Just wondering what some of your favorite memories of weather impacting a game, maybe at Beaver Stadium or on the road? 
I, see, this is where we're different because you guys say favorite memories with weather. To me, it was <laughs> like the worst ones because um, immediately I go to the the lightning delay in East Lansing. Sure. Uh, that was brutal. I mean, you're, you're out there, you're sitting there in the press box and you're like, OK, like, no, we've never experienced this before. Like, there's no playbook for how do you kill time during a lightning delay? Um, and so, you know, the kind of the running joke with us was we never saw lightning. Like the whole time we're there, it's just pouring, <laughs> and, you know, we're kind of going around the press box. And, uh, one of the, one of the writers, Dave Jones from uh, Penn live was like, does anyone see lightning? Like, I don't see any lightning. <laughs> and, uh, that was one of those games where I remember leaving my hotel in the morning. Cause I think it was like a noon kick and getting back at one o'clock in the morning because I was staying like toward the airport in Detroit and it's just like this was literally my entire day because of this lightning delay another one that sticks out um I guess this ultimately ended up being Joe Paterno's last home game um so there was that snow in like late October yes yep I just remember like that was I was a student at that time uh the scandal was my senior year and I just remember like you're like what in the world it's snowing in October and like they had the you know, actually shovel to see the lines on the field because it was that that distinct. I remember that storm too pretty well. Yeah. So a lot of our memories seem to jive here. And unfortunately, those games where weather's happening, I mean, it has a huge impact. I mean, you mentioned what do you do during a lightning delay? That may have cost them that game. And, and this year's Northwestern game too, they didn't play real well. Have you seen the team? Do they, do they practice for, for bad weather, Audrey? Like, oh, have, yeah. have you seen it affect the, the games though, in your opinion? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where, like, you look at it and, yeah, they do wet ball drills for sure. But the lightning delay was so bizarre. And I remember one of the things after the game, James Franklin said, he's like, you know what? Like, he's like, this is on us. We did not have a plan for how to handle a lightning delay. He's like, but I tell you what, moving forward, we absolutely will. Because uh, I just remember some of the stories from that of, like, what happened during that time span and it got to the point where everybody was hungry, so they had to feed them in the locker room, and those like Chick Fil A wrappers were everywhere. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's undoubtedly a huge impact, and I think even just like as a sports fan, right? Like, you always hear about teams that think they perform better in domes because of the noise, but then you take the roof off, and can those same teams play well in the conditions? And you know, there definitely is is something to that, to like kind of the whole whole weather element of it. But yeah, to me, that's the one thing where you're always like, you can prepare however much you want. You can do everything. And we, like these coaching staffs, they over-prepare, right? Like they think of seemingly everything. And then it's like, oh crap, here comes a lightning delay. Or now it's <laughs> a torrential downpour, which was what you had alluded to with Northwestern with the, the ball security issues for Penn State. Yeah, it's always something, especially in Big Ten country, right? Like you have to be prepared for these things in this conference. You're right, and, and we've seen it time and time again. So let's talk about the general state of the, the football program now. James Franklin going on a decade, hard to believe, of leading it. He's had four 11-win seasons, played Ohio State competitively, but only has the one victory against them. 2020, 2021, not so great. But uh, now coming off another 11-win season and a Rose Bowl victory against a top-10 opponent. So just in your own way, sum up James Franklin's tenure thus far. It's been a wild ride. I mean, I think there's been how many contracts during that span, right? Like the <laughs> a other lot. Part of it. Um, and I think you look at it, though, and James had said this before, and I think there's there's a lot of truth to it. When he got here, um, you know, program still reeling from the sanctions, the Bill O'Brien era, dealing with a bowl band, and that gets lifted to go to the pinstripe bowl. But I think it was because they were so successful early on in 2016 that it, like, set these ginormous expectations and then he didn't help that by with the great not yet elite comment, right? Because then that yeah. became a clear measuring stick. Um, and that's, you know, you're playing in the toughest division in college football. And, you know, you look at it with Michigan, Ohio State, you mentioned the records. I mean, that's tough sledding for, for anybody. And so I think you look at the success and you say, yeah, they've sustained a really high level of success. But then I get it. The fans say, but you haven't made the playoff. Now, there's a case to be made that in 2016, they could have and should have made the playoff, right? If, if I think if that happens, then this whole conversation is different. And then people think about the contract extension differently. And really, what a difference a year makes with that, too, right? Like, around this time last year, it's kind of like, all right, what in the world is Sandy Bar we're doing with this contract <laughs> extension? Like, like, he wants more commitment to the program, all these things. Then you look at it and you say, all right, well, this was supposed to be a bridge year and you win 11 games. Now, granted, you still lost your two biggest games, but you won the Rose Bowl. So, you know, it's it's a tough, tough business. Um, but I think you look at it and to me, that's the thing that stands out is like 
they were successful earlier than people thought they would be. And I think that set these sky high expectations. Um, and then, yeah, the kind of the two season outlier now looks like an outlier, which had you asked me this a year ago, I wouldn't have been so sure because kind of the way things, things were looking. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a wild ride, but yeah, 10, 10 seasons is a, that's a big, that's a big sample size. And I think James might even joke that perhaps Sean Clifford's been there for all 10 years. I mean, there's been a lot of age <laughs> jokes, two men that are kind of linked together, if you will. I mean, Sean Clifford, love him, hate him. Sometimes the fan base was for him. Sometimes they weren't. Brett and I are huge James Franklin supporters. We love the guy, but even we were divided on what to do about Sean Clifford. So what, if you could just briefly sum up, what did Clifford mean to the program, to James Franklin and, and this Rose Bowl magical season? Yeah, that was kind of the storybook ending that it didn't look like Sean Clifford was going to get, right? Like, that was the whole thing all along. He's the bridge to Drew Aller, like the next era, all of these things. Um, you know, he he, play, he saved his best football for the end, right? Like, I think you look at it, he bookends his starting career with the Cotton Bowl and the Rose Bowl. Um, you know, you can look at the stats. There's a lot of longevity records in there. You can go back, look at the throws that he made, a lot of ones that he didn't make. I think, like, the turnovers always kind of told the story with him and you know, I think that Purdue game was a great example of here's the the worst of Sean Clifford and the best of Sean Clifford with that, that game winning drive. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think for, for him, so much of it was, and I think people forget about this, he committed to Penn State super early on. Um, and so this is somebody who bought into the vision of this program. I mean, Clifford was in the stands at the Big Ten title game, again, which speaks to just how long this guy's been fully invested in this program. And I think that's part of it, too, because he was, a, he was an elite 11 quarterback. So it was like, all right, Penn State gets this guy. Now the career didn't live up to that billing, but ultimately him taking a stab at Penn State at that point where the program was, um, I think speaks volumes. But yeah, saved his best football for the end four-time team captain. I mean, that's something else that teammates always raved about the guy and so much of what he did beyond the field. Um, so I think that's all part of the legacy with him. It's not this, the, the nice thing is the way it ended, fans can kind of end with a high note for him because it was looking dicey there for a while and he was getting booed in intros. It's like, this is, this is yeah. kind of an ugly, very ugly situation for a while. And, you know, he did so much. I mean, I think people forget the injuries that he played through, the school records he set now. Those records are being teed up for another guy that, you know, getting a lot of praise early, hasn't played a ton of football yet. We've seen some glimpses in the blowouts. But Drew Aller, I know you just wrote a column about him on The Athletic. We hope everyone gets a chance to see it. Um, but tell me a little bit about this guy. What makes him tick? What are the differences between him and Clifford? This is your five-star quarterback with the big arm. This is the guy that everybody's been saying for years, Penn State needs an elite quarterback to get to where they want to go. Um, the thing that I think is really interesting with Drew is kind of how Penn State identified him early on in the process. Uh, this is somebody who Mike Yersich was interested in when Yersich um, was kind of looking around at quarterbacks before he even got to Penn State. And so then Yersich makes the jump to Penn State, and it's like, hey, we need to offer this guy from Ohio. I saw his tape. I really like him, like what he can do. Uh, so Penn State was in early on Aller, and that to me was as much of the difference as anything else because late in the process, Ohio State gets involved. They want him. Uh, again, Drew's an Ohio kid, so there's certainly that lore of the Buckeyes. But at that point, it was like, well, hey, you didn't want me earlier because you had Quinn Ewers, and then Quinn reclassifies, and all of a sudden they want Drew, and he's like, no, 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 like you didn't want me earlier, so – you know, there, there's that element to it. But a uh, quick story, the first time I watched Drew throw, um, I went to Medina, Ohio, to see him his senior year. And it was just a practice. And I'm standing there kind of on the sideline. And he just starts throwing the ball. And I'm looking. And I'm like, oh, like, this is, this is different. And again, this is just a practice. He's slinging it. Just the way the ball comes off of his hand, it's so noticeably different. It's impressive. And so afterward, I'm talking to him, and I was like, man, like, that was – you're making some really crazy throws in practice. He's like, yeah, that was only, like, 70% arm strength. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. So then I went and saw him play the, the next night, and that was kind of one of the challenges for reporters getting to see Drew play was that more often than not, he was only playing the first half of the game because they were blowing teams out. So it was kind of one of those situations where I think he might've played into the third quarter where I was there, but kind of that big rocket arm. The other thing is that he moves, I think a lot better than people give him credit for. And we started to see that a little bit this year. I know it came up in the Rutgers game when he came in. Um, but yeah, this is somebody who, again, the five-star talent that they've been clamoring for, 
I think the glimpses that you saw last year, everything indicates that he is as advertised that he's on the right track, but now we got to see the bigger sample size, right? Right. And maybe actually see him play a full game here uh, this season. So let's talk about coordinators for a second. Um, We've seen several in the James Franklin era. Uh, And speaking with uh, Franklin over the years, uh, what what does it look like, Audrey, his process for hiring, firing his assistant staff? And certainly from the outside, anyway, doesn't appear like he's afraid to make changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's one of the things in this business. It's ruthless, as I mentioned earlier. Like, you have to be willing to do that. And I think now, to some detriment, all the coordinator changes, I think that factors into Clifford's career. That's something that you do not want to go through again. I mean, it was – this place became a revolving door for offensive coordinators. That's problematic. Now, you can say, yes, when coordinators move on to better opportunities, I get that. We saw that with Joe Moorhead. Um but ultimately, like you want that stability. And that was that Kirk Shiraka year in 2020. I was surprised that after that one year that James Franklin was like, all right, we're going to somewhere else. But then as I started kind of reporting it out, it made more sense. And I started talking to people and they were like, yeah, your such was who he wanted last year, but Penn State couldn't hire your such at the time. So they go to Shiraka, um, have that year and kind of move on. Yeah, it's a one of the things Franklin said early on, it might've been during his like first year on the coach's caravan was that he has this black book. I think it was black. Maybe it's just a book. <laughs> he has this book. Um, I think the details better. if It's like a little black book, right? Like, yeah. Um, but in that book, he keeps names of coaches who he would like to one day be on his staff. Right. So I thought that was one of the most kind of interesting anecdotes because then every year at the coaches convention, he meets with some of these guys, just kind of grabs lunch, grabs dinner to pick their brain. So you're always updating that list. And to me, that's that's so much of the process of your coach. You always, so much of it's getting the talent on the field, but it's also all these other roles and how you round out your staff. Uh, we've seen the recruiting department, number of people there take off in Franklin's time here. This is, I believe now there's nine or 10 people who are full-time recruiting staffers. I want to say that number was like three or four when he got here. Um, so you've seen that number take off. You look at all the analyst roles that have come through that's another way in which you're supporting your program um now you look at other conferences you look in the sec and you say all right how many people are even in your building like ken (laughs) was here and for a while we're like ken's not even on your roster what is this guy doing here like there's just all these different pieces to a program that you know so much of it people think coordinators they think position coaches but there's so many other staffs and you can go on and on do sport performance and strength training and all these other areas that's all on him. That's part of the gig. Yeah. And so I guess some of our questions is, you know, we want to be in the Lash building. We want to see these guys interact. You get to see some of this. I think it was you that tweeted out some video early of Manny Diaz challenging the guys early in the season, but he brought this energy. Your sitch might be a little bit more laid back, but is it all one big happy family? Is the success kind of papering over any ego issues? But I mean, they're winning games. Something must be going I would, right. I wouldn't paint your such as easygoing. Um, okay. I think, I think very fiery uh, from no. the snippets we've seen. Again, like I haven't, I have not stepped foot in the Lash building since 2020, That's right? True. Like we haven't been allowed back in. So what we're seeing are glimpses at practice. You know, you're seeing glimpses on the sidelines during games, pregame, postgame, um, at camps in the summer, those kinds of things. So I think, and that's to me the thing that kind of stands out with Yursic is he will get on guys. But we, it was very obvious with Manny Diaz right away um, that there was this energy, this intensity with his defense. And then as Penn State went through spring ball last year, one of the things we kept hearing were the players were like, we love this guy. Like, man, he's so passionate. He gave this speech last, I think it was during spring ball last year in which like the tackling was really poor at practice. And the players said he was almost in tears when he was like breaking down the film with them. And it was like, this is unacceptable. This is so bad. Like we will never tackle like this again. And players took that to heart because it was a genuine, you know, a genuine example of who this guy is. And so again, back to your point about, about staff changing and turnovers, like you're managing egos, right? Like that's part of this. You're managing personalities and Manny Diaz has fit in so well in that regard. Um, that you look at it now and it's like all right last year at this time it's like how are you going to replace Brent Pry who's been with James forever this close you know relationship but also friendship and they were able to do that in a different way with a different personality Uh, but yeah Manny Diaz has certainly been been a huge 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 reason why this team was successful this year. 
Now, from the perspective of changes, the coaching staff is going to be largely intact, we think, next season, uh, which in theory will help uh, continue to build the program by that way of continuity. Uh, but the one change was at wide receiver coach. You mentioned it. It kind of blew up the, the Sunday night Twitter feeds uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, was this uh, surprising to you? And, and let's talk about the, the new man on campus uh, with, with uh, Haggins coming in. Yeah, Marcus Haggins is somebody that they bring in from UVA. Um, initially, I was surprised that they made a move just because I think I, I didn't think there was a ton of proven talent in that receiving room. Now, that's twofold, right? I think you look at it and you can say, well, is the development there? Why isn't the development there? But then I kind of look at it and I'm like, all right, well, you just signed five receivers, you know, and of those five, only one guy burned a red shirt. So there's a lot of stuff that we don't know about that room. Um, so there's that part of it. But I think you also can go back to, well, you've now had to go to the transfer portal two years in a row for immediate help. So I think that speaks a lot about the state of your room as well. So I was a little surprised, um, but then they go, they make a hire, make it public within a week. And the thing I like is you look at the Virginia ties. This is an area that's been really good at Penn State. There's so much talent in Virginia. You look at what Anthony Poindexter has been able to do there, obviously his ties to UVA. So now you're doubling down in Virginia and that's important, right? I think like that's a significant area. There's a ton of talent there. So it makes sense in that regard. And then I think that room, you have to see this spring, this summer, how it grows and develops. You go out, you get Dante Cephas, but you're waiting until he gets here, right? So there's that element to it where you make that portal splash, which was also interesting because Cephas then announced like within 30 minutes of Taylor Stubblefield's firing and you're like, what in the world's going on? <laughs> um, it became yeah. like this whole week of wide receivers. And then you also have the element of you have to fill that recruiting coordinator role. That was the other part of Stubblefield's job and Haggins will do that as well. So you have that, that part of it too, that has to slot in. But yeah, initially I was surprised. And then I think the more you kind of think through it, it's like, okay, Stubblefield's bounced around a lot uh, in this industry. And he came here, was looking for stability. He had three years to do it. But, you know, you only signed one receiver in this class and you had to go to the portal. So, like, I can kind of see it. But then again, I think of the room that he took over. And at that point, they weren't in a great spot either. And it feels like they're kind of back to that same spot where they were when Stubblefield was hired. And, and speaking of position group rooms, it seems like we're getting a lot of talent back in an era where a lot of guys want to jump to the NFL. There's the transfer portal, a lot of temptation out there, but perhaps with the winning this year, the loyalty factor to Franklin, it seems like we're getting a ton of talent back to make a run next year. Yeah, they are. I mean, now I think it's not the only reason, like the success isn't the only reason that guys are coming back. Um, I mean, you have to look at it on a case by case basis. And I think if you look at somebody like Olu Fashion, you say, okay, Projected first round pick seems like a slam dunk that the guy's going to go, but you have to peel that back and say, all right, he turned 20 uh, in December, <laughs> right? really young guy. He's played about 600 snaps in his college career, which not a massive sample size. Um, his family and speaking with them and speaking with Olu, they weren't ready for him to be in an NFL locker room at 20 years old. They were like, listen, like this is one of those things where we're not, we're not comfortable with making that jump. So he's going to come back. You look at a guy like Adisa Isaac and you say, okay, He's somebody who I thought was on the fence, could certainly go. He comes back. Well, Isaac's telling me in the lead up to the Rose Bowl that he still did not feel 100% from his season ending injury the year before. So, again, another year back helps him, helps Penn State. So, I think you got a lot of decisions like that. You got Curtis Jacobs coming back. You got Theo Johnson. I mean, there isn't anybody in this draft class or this group of draft eligible guys that I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm shocked that they left, right? Like Joey Porter Jr., stock super high first round pick like not going to get any higher i completely get that uh juice scruggs you look at it ready to move on doesn't want to come back for a sixth year completely understandable um so yeah i think but that to your point all these guys returning builds the excitement the expectations uh, which is a different spot than penn state's been in around here the last few off seasons uh, agree. And I want to go back just before we talk about next season, though, and touch on, on one of the things that, that um, you had kind of hinted at, and that is, you know, college football these days is about roster management. And, I, you know, I, I'm just curious. You know, we talked about the weather. Dan and I lose sleep when there's a big storm coming. We want to make sure the <laughs> forecast is right. But college coaches, I'm sure, lose a lot of sleep with this roster management stuff. Because you're talking about individual stories and guys returning, and they all do it for different reasons. But how does a coach, and how has Penn State 
you know, manage the transfer portal and recruiting in general. I mean, it seems like Franklin's done a decent job in this department overall, but what's your assessment and, and what, what are some of the stories that you know that, that, that coaches struggle with? I mean, this is a, this is a big story in college football in 2023. Oh, yeah. Every staff right now has at least one person who's monitoring the portal. And the thing that the NCAA has done is they've made these two windows. So you had the first window that recently closed where players could enter the portal. And then we're going to have a second wave or next window that's going to be March 1 to March 15. So during that window, guys post spring ball, they're going to kind of be able to see where they stand. The thing that Penn State has always done is they'll meet with their players toward the end of the regular season. They typically do so again at the end of spring ball and lay it out for them is, hey, this is where we see you. This is where you fit in. So really not a whole lot of gray area of like, are you going to contribute? Or are you going to be a big factor or not? So then the player then has the decision to make. Now, roster management has become crazy, but I do think Penn State's done a really nice job with that because you look at what they've done with the portal. Typically, they've gone for guys who can make an instant impact who've been able person, personality-wise to fit in pretty easily because, again, you're managing egos and personalities. That's the other part of this. Manny Diaz always tells us, like, you have to remember we're not playing fantasy football here. Like, that part matters. Uh, but they've gotten instant impact players, and they've done it again this year with Dante Cephas once he gets here after wrapping up uh, obligations at Kent State later on in the spring. You know, you look at Arnold Ebicady, Chop Robinson has been mm -hmm. significant. I think the thing that's different with Chop is this is a guy who is more than just a one-off. Like, this is somebody who's going to be here at least this year, and we'll see kind of where, where things stand after that. Um, so they've done a really nice job. Mitch Tinsley, like, the list goes on and on with guys that they've had. Derek Tangelo. So, but it, it's difficult, right? Because you're you're making, I think, an open open assessment of, hey, we're going to the portal. These are our needs which speaks volumes to the people who are in that room currently, right? Like Penn State this year, it was, hey, we need at least two receivers, whether we get somebody else in the second signing period, whether we get two for the transfer portal. So if you're in that receiving room, you're like, all right, they're trying to bring in somebody to take my job, right? And that's just, that's what this sport is right now. And, you know, quarterbacks are, that's kind of the craziest thing in all of this quarterback movement. And I know it's, Seemingly always a big talking point with the Penn State fan base. When you look at transfer portal, who did they lose? People go to Will Levis. I always default to that and say there was nothing that we saw at that point in time that suggested Will Levis was better than Sean Clifford. And I think you can look at it now with a much clearer and bigger sample size. If you're picking one of those guys for this past season, I think you take Clifford. Um, yes, Levis has the arm. NFL talent evaluators love that. Uh, but the turnovers were extremely problematic. So, you know, again, it, it's always this this year-round thing of, one, who are you signing out of high school? How are you developing them? And then, two, who are you trying to add to fill needs? And then how does that person mesh with your your staff, with everybody else in that room? So you've mentioned a lot about some of the new talent coming in with Drew Aller, and then we have two new wide receivers as transfers. Plus, you mentioned some of the guys that are already in the room, some of the young guys, whether it's uh, Sand uh, Saunders, Evans, Trey Wallace. I mean, talk to me about some of these downfield threats that Aller's going to have at his disposal. Yeah, to me, it's, it's encouraging how Keandre Lambert-Smith ended the year, right? Like, you look at it, big performance in the Rose Bowl, had a nice game against Michigan State. And that's what they're going to need because you're bringing in Dante Cephas, who very well could be your number one receiver. And that's interesting, right? Like you're banking sure. on someone from Kent State who had two monster seasons, but you're banking on him potentially being your number one guy. And, oh, by the way, once he gets here, he then needs to learn the offense, get up to speed with Drew. Like it's going to be a crash course. I'm really curious to see kind of how they go about getting him up to speed so quickly. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think uh, Harrison Wallace, they call him Trey. Trey Wallace is certainly – one of those guys that I think you look at the the, uh, the explosive element to him. But the one guy that was really intriguing to me this year, and again, this is, if we're having this conversation a year ago at this time, I would not have projected that Amari Evans is somebody who burns his red shirt because he was a high school quarterback. But I think there's a lot to like there with Evans. But again, like Caden Saunders is someone who I would have said, all right, this is maybe a guy you see this year, but we didn't. And so, again, there's a lot of intrigue in that room. And you had Christian Driver, who switches over. He came here as a DB. Now he's in that receiving room. So you've got five really young receivers 
who are going to have to shake out in this whole thing. Then you add two from the portal. Then you have Carmelo Taylor, who you signed out of high school. So to me, there's going to be a ton of new faces in that room. But yeah, they're certainly going to need Keandre Lambert-Smith to be part of that, kind of where Liam Clifford factors in all of this is interesting too, because he kind of started to become a little bit of a safety net for Drew Aller this year. We started to see a little bit of that connection. Um, so yeah, that's all going to be going to be part of this offseason for sure. And Christian Driver, I will note, is Donald Driver's son. Franklin was uh, on the Green Bay Packers staff. You're a big Packers fan, we know. So yes. there, there's all kinds of <laughs> there's all kinds of connections yeah. there. Three or four more questions, Audrey. Here, just quickly, take us back to the Rose Bowl briefly, and just talk about how important you think that win was, and then what it was like covering that that event. Yeah, I mean, it's significant because you look at you know, the 11 win total, that's big. And then you also look at, I think the expectations for this season. I mean, I thought this was a team that maybe they go eight and four again, after overvaluing the last two years, I was like, I'm going to aim low. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> I think I, we did I, the I same. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't see 2020, 2021 coming. Um, so it's big, it's big in terms of recruitment because it, to me, it shows that you can sustain a high level of success that these previous two years, 2020, 2021, that they've been the outlier. And so I think that's then part of your pitch to recruits. And, oh, yeah, by the way, you did that while having this highly touted recruiting class where a lot of these guys started to get on the field and burn red shirts. Guys like Abdul Carter, Denai Dennis Sutton. You know, you saw, obviously, the two freshman running backs. That's a huge part of this, too. Um, to me, that's a big pitch as well, because then you can say to other recruits, well, look it, we just had this many guys burn red shirts as true freshmen. That's enticing. If you want to play, play right away, you can do that. Um, you know, so to me, that's the significance of it and covering it. It was really cool. I mean, it's both times I've covered the Rose Bowl. The weather has not been great. So you guys will not <laughs> do that. You right, know, right. Like, oh, the picturesque sunset. <laughs> no sunset. Yeah. It was great the whole time. And then the crazy part was like everybody in Pennsylvania is like, oh, it's like such a great weather week here. It's like in the fifties. And I was like, yeah, it's like raining out here all week. I think we have like one nice day. Um, but still it's Southern California. It's a great time, but yeah, covering that, uh, the nice thing, the cool thing about it was we were able to be on the field for like the last few minutes of the game. So you're able to see kind of the confetti and like those raw emotions. And to me, that's the stuff that as a reporter, you're trying to capture, right? Like LeVar Arrington's on the field and he's there with Manny Diaz. And I was able to kind of hear what he's saying to Manny of like, Hey, if you ever need me reach out and you know, then you've got players walking around celebrating and you've got guys like Clifford who know for sure this is it. This is the last time. And he's, you know, crying as he greets his family. And so it's just all these these really cool snippets and pieces of, of really a season that kind of come to light. But in some cases, a career. So, yeah, despite the downpour that happened, like got completely soaking wet on the field um, in those <laughs> last. Events, but it was a it was a really cool scene for sure. And they beat a very good team in the process, too, and, and look good doing it. So yeah. asking a big question here, we know they're a top 10 team. Can they be a top five team? Can we make that playoff run? Is this the year to go from great to elite? The big question. That's the million dollar question, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that to me is the again, it's still you can look at Ohio State and say, all right, well, they're going to have a new quarterback, too. Right. Like you have that. You look at Michigan, you get Blake Corum back, you got J.J. McCarthy. To me, that's the one, despite all of the Jim Harbaugh overtures of heading elsewhere, right? That's now become a thing, uh, just about every offseason, it seems, right? It's like, you still have to get past those two teams, and now you're going to the horseshoe this year. But Michigan comes to Beaver Stadium, so that that game's going to be wild, right? Like, that you got to be here. Um, but to me, that's the, you got to get past both of those teams. And so I'm still, again, very, very early in the process here. You should be at least 10 and two with those two games defining your season. Um, now they've played well against Ohio state. And sometimes people like to give me crap for that because they're like, Oh no, no, no. Like Ohio state fans are like, no, they haven't. I'm like, you hung with Ohio state for three quarters this year. That is more than a lot of teams can say, but then they kind of beat the doors off of you in the fourth quarter. So there's that uh, to me, Michigan's the team that Penn state just has not matched up well against. But I think you look at it now and you say, all right, like you should be a very balanced offense. You don't need Drew Aller to be Superman right away, right? You've got two really talented running backs. You've got really good tight ends. Your offensive line continues to get better. Um, your defensive line continues to develop as well. 
uh, to me, that's kind of the thing of like, all right, how do you kind of ease into this season? And oh yeah, you've got West Virginia off the bat. So you're not, you know, you're not starting off again with, with a cupcake game either. So yeah, to me, that's the, that's the thing that can they take that next step? Um, As of right now, who the heck knows? Um, But I still think asking a, a first time starting quarterback, that's a lot to go into the horseshoe. But again, they've been able to play Ohio state pretty much pretty well. That's what it's going to come down to. Uh, this has been fantastic. One, one final question, Audrey, as, as we wrap things up here um, again, let's look ahead for a bit. James Franklin, we have said has been at Penn state for a while um, and given his contract, he's probably going to be there barring anything catastrophic uh, in terms of coaching record or anything like that. He appears to be building the pieces to compete on this national stage, especially with the playoff expanding, you know, recruiting, hiring, bugging the administration to spend uh, every year seems to be paying off for him. So with that expansion coming here in, in uh, two years, uh, does this new administration really buy into his vision, new AD, new president, and can Penn State be a playoff team every year and start competing for national titles again loaded question but basically is the new admin buying into his vision yeah they're aligned and to me that's been really obvious um when you look at neely bendapudi you look at pat Kraft. um there's alignment there that toward the end of the barber eric baron regime like it it was not orchestrating in sync and it was very clear of james franklin kind of making this passive aggressive push for wanting more but not really saying what he wants and then you know you kind of look at the scheduling and it's like all right You went down to Auburn this year and we heard this year, Franklin, like, let's never do that again. Like he hated that. Right. So to me, that speaks to the divide that was happening there when you're lining up future scheduling. And that's just one example. Um, But to me, it's been completely different. I think you look at it now and, you know, you see Pat Kraft as somebody who is very bought in on what James wants, who's listening to him. Right. There's a very good relationship there. There's a good back and forth. Um, And it's important, too, that you have the university president in lockstep with this, because so much of the things that James Franklin wants and desires, like they're university things, not just necessarily football. Right. Like if you want improved housing for athletes, that impacts the rest of your student body. Like that's a conversation that has to be had at the university level. If you look at NIL and the strides that Penn State has made, they were slow to react out of the gate with NIL. Well, they're catching up now, but how far behind were you, right? So, like, there's all these pieces to the puzzle that have to factor in. And we can all point to Saturdays and results on the field, but this is a year-round arms race in college football, right? Now so more than ever, um, it's just this ongoing thing that you have to be cognizant of. And you have to have those honest conversations of what do you want and what realistically do you need, right? Like, what are some of those things? And, oh, yeah, the other part of all of this, what are you going to do to Beaver Stadium? Because that decision oh, yeah. has to come in here soon, right? Like, seems like at some point you're going to start a significant renovation with the stadium. You need to have those three parties in line when you roll that plan out, when you figure out how you're going to fundraise that. Um, so that, to me, is kind of the next thing that, that could be coming as well. Very nice. So, Audrey, we really thank you very much. Can you remind everyone where we can find your work and your social media as well? Yeah, you can read me at The Athletic um, and on Twitter at at OddSnyder4. That's the number four. And you mentioned earlier the Packers thing. So that's where (laughs) that's where it comes from. So now I'm kind of stuck with that four. I guess I don't know. I guess we could change it. (laughs) Oh, why bother at this point? No, that's that's where we know how to find you. We appreciate you stopping by. And, you know, listen, come back, and especially we'll keep an eye on, on uh, the weather this football season. If, if there's another bad weather game, we want you to come back and tell us about it. We appreciate your time. You got it, guys. And if there's bad weather and you don't tell me about it, I'm, I'm going to totally blame you for it. <laughs> yeah, Sounds, we'll start that's tagging fair. you in some of the posts. <laughs> that's fair. That's what we'll do. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Audrey. Oh, boy, that that was a lot of fun. And we've been put on notice, haven't we? We have certainly been put on notice. And I, I just have to say how much, as a Penn State alum, as a Penn State fan, I just truly enjoyed that conversation. I mean, we, we delved into so many topics, but perhaps one of those important ones is how the program moves forward. And, you know, James Franklin in the background has been driving this ship year after year. Hey, 
We need to spend more money. Hey, these programs are outpacing us. How well, do we keep up? And I think that that's the thing. And, and fans get a little tired of hearing that, and they want the results on Saturdays. Uh, Franklin's argument is, listen, you, you, we are working our, our, our darndest on that, but sometimes it's all of that behind-the-scenes stuff and those machinations it matters. that matters on Saturdays because we read an article this week. We're hoping to speak with the author of that article from Sports Illustrated next week for you that talked about Franklin going to the trustees' meeting and demanding, well, not maybe demanding, but sort of demanding and asking, saying, hey, Politicking. we need to be competitive because guess what? We're in a great spot right now. We are, according to some preseason polls, number five in the country. Recruiting's been going well. Guess what, though? Two teams in our division, in our own division, they're number three and four. Well, and that makes a difference. Think about that. And those are the two teams we lost to. Yeah, the, the teams we're chasing. And it's so important to remember. Football drives the athletic ship at these universities. And so coming off a of Rose Bowl year, this is the time to ask for things because revenue is up and, and it, it matters. The, one of the reasons revenue is up and it's going to continue to go up, what just happened? Oh, I mean, we got mega deals. Big Ten, SEC. Yes, and something else, rights. something else we want to touch on going forward, uh, we will talk a lot about this, uh, maybe some next week and in the weeks to come. The Pac-12 is struggling right now to find a TV yes. partner. And there was just, speaking of The Athletic and Audrey, and uh, there was just an article written by Chris Vanini there talking about how the Pac-12 is struggling to find streaming uh, rights, any type of rights. Apple TV has come in as a late bidder. Streaming, though, the point of the article is not saving TV. No, and that's the interesting aspect of it. That in fact, they're know, losing money. A lot of the streamers. Correct, and you know we're seeing a shift in our industry. You know we went hard into digital. Mm -hmm. Now we got to pivot a little bit because the revenue simply isn't there. And it's so, spread out. They they need to find a way to work together. Right. And I think one of the things that um, I've heard several people mention this week, and a lot of the things that I listen to and that I read is, if you are a diehard college football fan, college football is in the NFL. You are watching multiple games and multiple windows. How easy is it going to be to find the Pac-12 if it's say on Apple TV Plus? Now, some people, some really diehard fans, do have four or five TVs up. I get that. But for your casual fan that wants to watch games, you cannot just do this. Uh -huh. If the Pac-12, for example, is on Apple TV, then you run the risk of people not finding your games. Correct. And then you run the risk of falling farther into irrelevancy. The abyss, right. In, into the abyss. That's a great way to put it. So they're, they're really this, – this is a story. We talked about it, too, with the Phillies. Yes. Yeah, and I Matt mean, Gelb. Exactly. And and Matt's point was simply there needs to be reach, there needs to be access for all fans to keep the fandom going. Correct. You need people watching the product. I, I just read, too, that, you know, Peacock, the streaming service from Comcast, they're going to start to charge Comcast subscribers. Interesting. Because it's been losing money. They, they need to buy things and create content. You can't just run a streamer without sure. content. But then the problem is they're losing money because they don't have enough subscribers right. to keep up. Even Disney Plus... One of the, the article mentioned, they've gained subscribers, they're losing money. That's wild. It, it is, but they... they you have they, to you feed know, the beast. They're, they're making a lot of Star Wars shows over there. Right. So they, yeah. they, you know, it takes it, money. It takes money to do that. So the, the Pac-12 and where they land is going to be huge because you don't... You, you need, as you just said, and, and Matt Gelb said it, and, and you know the Big Ten is set now for seven years. They, they have access. You can get the Big Ten with an antenna for the yep. most part, or at least a simple cable package. You need your fans to be able to watch your games. Well, and, and my moreover point here is what you run the risk of is if you're the Pac-12, you've already lost USC. You've already lost. Correct. You, you've lost your, your mainstay program. Who's next? UCLA's out. Could it be Oregon if they screw this up? Well, right, and that's the thing. It's all going to be so dependent on that on that revenue right. coming in or, 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 or going out, and and it, and it and it matters hugely. This isn't the NFL. The NFL can afford people not watching the Thursday Correct. night game. It's one game. Sometimes the teams are pretty crappy, right? And uh, again, that's that's one night a week. So if you get Amazon Prime, you, you can tune in. You're not necessarily channel Correct. surfing either. But this is such a different beast that I think the Pac-12 is going to have problems if they can't get at least some of their rights over to ESPN, but they're being selective with what they bid on. They lost the Big Ten. Yes, they did, because, again, you can only absorb so much and still 
make a profit, and ESPN's very worried about that profit. Correct. Uh, Interesting lots, stuff. Lots, lots to talk about here, and uh, as always, it is. Let's uh, let's go to the promo graphic and tell folks once again where you can find us. We are everywhere you are, and we want you to tweet at us, Facebook us, uh, let us know what you think, and of course, weigh in on that Audrey Snyder interview. Oh, I mean, absolutely. If you are a Penn State fan, and perhaps you have a question for us to ask some of these guests that we're bringing on, we'd love to hear from you. Weatherwaders at gmail.com. Audrey was a fantastic guest. I want to bring in our good friend Dave Shiner here one last time, too. I mean, you know, Audrey, talking all things Penn State, you're wearing a Penn State hat today. There's a lot of excitement right now Method for Happy to Valley. My madness, uh, well, uh, <laughs> yeah. you said it. Uh, let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. I think we're, we're, we're set up for a good season. We are. She, she brought those points up, and as we mentioned, we're going to talk more about that, that interesting meeting that Franklin had with his trustees next week. Got to so. spend money to make money. That's right. David, thank you for your help Always. today. Mr. Tommaso, thank you for Absolutely. yours. Absolutely. And uh, take us away. Yeah, we're going to roll things out into next week. Enjoy the spring-like weather here in the Northeast. Savor it while you can. Think baseball. We're getting there, folks. Have a good one.